Diverticular disease is an umbrella term used to describe a spectrum of diseases associated with the presence of diverticula, defined as sac-like pouches that protrude from a tubular structure. Diverticulosis refers to the presence of diverticula, and diverticulitis means inflammation of the diverticula that may be with or without infection. They can happen anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract, but true diverticula are those in which all layers of the gastrointestinal tract protrude. Examples include Meckel's diverticulum and esophageal diverticula. Pseudodiverticula are where the mucosa and submucosa protrude through the muscular layers, such as in colonic diverticula, which are the most common, particularly in the sigmoid colon. These are the ones that we will be focusing on. The exact mechanism is not known, but is thought to be linked to increased intraluminal pressure leading to protrusion of the mucosa and submucosal layers through the weaker portions of the muscular layers, usually around the intramural vessels. This may explain why the sigmoid is more commonly affected, due to the smaller diameter. Formation is thought to be multifactorial. The risk factors include a diet low in fibre, which is thought to be the predominant factor in Western populations, or diets high in red meat, smoking, obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, and the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. There may also be a degree of heritability. The size is generally between 3 and 10 millimetres and become more common with age as under 10% of people at 40 are affected, while 75% of those over the age of 80 are thought to have them. In around 80% of people with diverticula, they are asymptomatic. Symptoms that do develop vary significantly depending on the underlying process. For example, symptomatic diverticulosis commonly features abdominal pain, typically in the left lower quadrant, bloating, and intermittent constipation or diarrhea. Diverticulitis is as we said when the diverticula become inflamed, which tends to feature pain in the left lower quadrant in Caucasian populations and right lower quadrant in Asian populations. There may also be nausea, vomiting, fever, and in some cases, bleeding. The inflammation can also predispose to perforation and peritonitis as well as fistula formation, such as to the bladder or to the uterus, as well as a risk of intestinal obstruction and abscess formation. Presence of these features would be called complicated diverticulitis. Bleeding from the diverticula occur in around 15% of cases, and usually causes painless hematoketsia, meaning a fresh red bleed rather than melina, which is a dark, black, stained stool getting its colour from haemoglobin being digested in the gastrointestinal tract, although right-sided diverticular bleeding can cause melina. The exact reason of the bleeding is not certain, but may be due to impacted faeces eroding the vessel surface or the diverticulum growing and tearing the vessels. Segmental colitis associated with diverticulosis is a term used to describe chronic inflammation that is attributed to the diverticulosis. This often presents with abdominal pain, again typically on the left side, diarrhea and hematoketsia. Diagnosis of colonic diverticula is often made as an incidental finding on colonoscopy or CT, done for other reasons. But in symptomatic patients, CT is generally the modality of investigation. Colonoscopy is recommended one to three months after resolution of an episode of diverticulitis to assess for colorectal cancer. For those presenting with bleeding, a colonoscopy is generally the first line. However, a CT angiography is another option. Blood tests are quite non-specific and include a full blood count, which may demonstrate leukocytosis, as well as other inflammatory markers like CRP. In general, the treatment can vary largely depending on the severity. Asymptomatic diverticulosis does not require treatment or diet modification, while those with symptomatic diverticulosis may benefit from a high-fibre diet 
although the evidence currently is not conclusive. Bulk forming laxatives are recommended in cases featuring constipation. In diverticulitis, the uncomplicated diverticulitis cases may be treated conservatively with analgesia and may not necessarily need antibiotics, while those with more severe or complicated diverticulitis are likely to require antibiotic therapy, bowel rest and intravenous fluids. There may also be a need for abscess drainage or even surgery if the diverticula is perforated, which can involve resecting the affected part of the colon with subsequent anastomosis. Initial management of diverticular bleeding will be similar to other bleeds, that is ensuring hemodynamic stability, for example using the shock index. Treatment may mean emergency imaging and endoscopy, intravenous fluid resuscitation and blood transfusion. 75% of diverticular bleeding will spontaneously resolve, therefore supportive care may be adequate, like stopping anticoagulants and encouraging oral intake, while others may need endoscopy with band ligation, clips or adrenaline injection to stop the bleeding. If angiography is done, then it can also offer therapeutic options in the form of embolization. Surgical resection of the part of the bowel affected may be indicated if there are repeat refractory bleeds.